<laughs> hi Della, hi Connie, hi Y Tala, hi Lucy. We got Aga, we got Nen, Yanni, Vicky, Hajit. Sorry, I'm really, really bad at pronouncing names. So if I got it wrong, please do apologize. Accept my apologies. Um, we might have a few more people joining in, but let's just see. So just a quick introduction, just in case. I'm Stanford. I'm a medical doctor who worked in psychiatry, working in psychiatry uh, and also previously worked in maternity. I am a yoga teacher and also training in yoga therapy under Colin, please. Hi, I'm Ed Colin. Um, I'm a yoga therapist. Uh, really good to see all of you this evening. Um, we've taken a subject matter. Um, N is for nervous breakdown. So we've, we've kind of, last time we met, we did M for menopause. And, and this time, N for nervous breakdown. And we have a first question for Stanford. Is nervous breakdown, is it a medical term or is it a term that um, encompasses a number of different ideas? You are being kind to me. You, you're asking me a question that we use already in the promotional material. So technically speaking, I think nowadays nervous breakdown is no longer a, a, an official medical term. Mm -hmm. I think back in the days when uh, we're going back maybe even a few hundred years ago, uh, it was. Um, or in some older terms, it was called hysteria, especially in women in, or in females. Um, but now there's this more common phrase than anything else. Um, it can be associated with um, psychiatric conditions such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, a few others as well, sometimes extreme forms of um, OCD even. Uh, funny enough, it's gonna be our next topic. Uh, these can be, uh, also called nervous breakdown as well, as well as burnout, which is another very, very topical topics. Um, a closer medical term is called psychotic breakdown, but actually, in fact, when I start researching and also in my clinical practice, it's something quite, quite different. So psychotic breakdowns when you have let's say a disorder like schizophrenia it doesn't always have to be schizophrenia but it's one of the common more common ones that I can use as an example uh, where you kind of lose the grasp of reality so uh, you may hallucinate you may have um, really really bizarre delusion where you kind of lost that grip with what's happening around you and also inside of you um, whilst nervous breakdown is kind of something that really really impactful has happened to you so something very very stressful and overwhelming um, not only um, mentally but also emotionally sometimes can be both as well uh, so that you no longer be able to perform day-to-day -day life so you can still be within grasp of what's happening around you you just can't really function as you normally would again with quotation mark around normal um, so yeah, Colin, that's not really a medical term. Mm. How about in yoga? Is there such a Ayurvedic or Sanskrit term for nervous breakdown? The nearest I've I've got to it is um, is prana prakopa, or agitation of. Prakopa means anger, so it's an anger of the um, the vayu or the prana within the system. So if we start to look at um, the common symptoms that you get of nervous breakdown, it, we start to then sort of match them in the way that the um, prana vata or prana values work in the system. But if I just jump back a second before I explain this, um, so we've got sort of several different things going on within this. You've got a, a symptom level. So you've got the symptom level, which tends to be energetic or tends to be within the physical domain. And you've got effects also within the mental domain as well but then you've got causes which come into the mental domain into the belief system and also into the emotional domain so when we start to look at the panchamaya model we're starting to see cause and effects sort of running between these sort of five different domains um, so you, you're sort of seeing this link between cause and effect so we, we've got on the one side we've got symptoms and if we start to look at um if we start to look at one second, sorry about that. If we start to look at symptoms, um, things like irregular heartbeat, which it, it, it is a symptom, um, pain in the muscles, tension in the body. If we start to look at clammy hands, dizziness, um, 
trembling, shaking, upset stomach, exhaustion, aches and pains, coughs, headaches, restlessness, sensitivity. We start to look at those. We start to match it with the functioning of the panchavaya or panchavata. So if we look at pranavaya, pranavata, when it works well, you get sort of vivacity, clarity, joy, inspiration, positivity, spirit of life, and a connection to our inner self. When it gets imbalanced, you get worries, you get agitation, you get insomnia, you get breath trouble, you get heart troubles. So why I'm kind of going down this pathway is that actually what we're starting to do is we start to see the symptoms with regard to how yoga and Ayurveda is actually looking at the construct of a human being. But it also means that we can then use tools which then start to target this because everyone is individual, but they'll be presenting different symptoms or similarities of symptoms, but there'll be causes that will be much, they'll be much deeper within the system. And so one of the first steps that we have to look at is we have to look at what the symptoms are and look at pacifying that. But that's only the first step. Then we have to then look at how do we then go deeper. So I'm hoping today between us, what we'll do is we'll be able to start of sort of build a little more of a framework around this idea of nervous breakdown, looking at symptoms, but also looking at how these symptoms come out, perhaps some tools that help to pacify the symptoms, but also looking deeper in the system because it's deeper in the belief system within the rules that people create that actually there tends to be a lot of issue. Um, shall I continue with the functioning of the... Yeah, go for it. Okay, I was just asking. <laughs> you, are, you are literally saying things that I was going to say anyway, because in Western medical terms, we also divide um, like the presentation of nervous breakdown in physical, emotional, and behavior. So you keep going. I think everyone just loves hearing your voice more than mine. No, no, how can you say that? I've actually, I stole your handout earlier on today. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it probably resides within this area here, the top part of the chest area here. And so when it gets, with normal function, we get one effect. When it becomes unbalanced, we get a different effect. And so what we're starting to see is we start to see an unbalanced effect within the system. And this helps us with regard to what we need to do to pacify this. The next is that there's another prana in the throat called udana. Um, and with its normal function, we get good speech, we get good memory, we get clarity of mind. We get the capacity to exhale, we get vomiting. But with when it's unbalanced, we get trouble with the voice, we get dry coughing, we get ENT issues, we get exhaustion, we get a breakdown of memory and we get a lack of judgment. So when we start to sort of begin to pair these up, we're starting to see that actually the common symptoms that we get within Western medicine with regard to nervous breakdown starts to correlate directly with the unbalance of the function of prana within the system. The next one is samana, and samana, when with its normal function, you get assimilation. Um, you get the separation between what is pure and impure, what is to be nourished and what is to be eliminated. And so with the result of that, you get a good, good kind of cooking of absolutely everything, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, you get a good cooking, a processing function of things that happen in the system. Now, when it gets out of balance, people can't process things. They get overwhelmed with things. Things, are, either their digestive system becomes too fast, too slow, they gain weight, they decrease in weight. So this starts to be sort of this imbalance that's being presented here. And a pana, um, which is in the abdomen, it brings everything that has to be eliminated to the points that help the elimination within the system. Now, when it's unbalanced, we get constipation, we get diarrhea, we get all sorts of abdominal troubles. And when we start to think about the issues that we're getting, 
and the symptoms that are being given, we start to see that what's happening is that irregular heartbeat, we get pain in muscles, we get clammy hands, we get dizziness, we've got trembling and shaking, upset stomach, exhaustion, aches and pains, coughs, headaches, restlessness and sensitivity. And a majority of these are linked to Vyana Vayu or Vyana Vata. And Vyana Vata manages the circulation of everything through the system. And it's almost that everything cannot circulate or the system itself has not got the capacity to carry what it needs to carry. So there is almost an overload of the system. So when it works well, you've got good heart rate, good blood pressure, good perspiration, you've got yawning, you've got all body movement. When it becomes unbalanced, when Vyanavata is unbalanced, you get a change in blood pressure, so either high blood pressure or very low blood pressure, which gives the dizziness and gives the other bits and pieces. You get a change in heart rate, so you get irregular heart rate, but it's a regular, irregular heart rate, which gives the palpitations and gives the sense of causing an issue. You get a lot of stress within the system. You get a lot of nerve issues. You get a lot of shaking, twitching, and these type of things. So for me, what I start to do is I'm starting to look at what the symptoms are being presented by someone. And I'm beginning to correlate a lot of the symptoms with the functioning of the vata or vayu within the system to understand the first stage, which is how do I pacify this and how do I pacify what's going on? Does that make any sense, Daphne? No, it's making a whole lot of sense. And I think in some way, uh, it, again, it really matched the list I've got, uh, but I'm gonna answer Lauren's question, uh, which is, it sounds quite similar to panic attack. Are they related to each other? I think uh, you can put your perspective on as well, Colin, but I think from my, uh, from my, my, my corner, um, Panic attack and nervous breakdown can be incredibly, incredibly similar. However, I think usually panic attack has more uh, end point to it. Usually uh, it defines by you, you, you wait for it to subside and there's a subsiding point, whereas nervous breakdown tend to be slightly longer lasting. So panic attack, it may last for minutes, for some people it lasts for hours. If it goes into days, usually we will say that it's slightly further than panic attack, but I think um, nervous breakdown, or at least the one that I've seen or the ones that I've heard about or be or treated, actually, uh, they tend to last a little bit longer than that. And I think the difference in some way is panic attack, they both have this emotional and behavioral and also physical symptoms outburst. Um, but in a shorter term, in panic attack, they tend to be have the ability to self-regulate again, whilst um, in nervous breakdown, kind of, you know, the, 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 the roof is gone and like, everything's let loose kind of thing. So that, that's my perspective. What do you think, Colin? I agree with you completely. Um, and I would say that within the whole process of breakdown, there are panic attacks that occur. So it's almost that you've got a, a process that's happening we can come to break down the causes into three different areas so um, let's take a cause as being um, something that we apply on ourselves so I push I have a client that pushes themselves at work they push and push and push very hard indeed and I'll talk a little bit more about all the rules that we create around this and they put so much pressure on themselves that they have what they consider to be a nervous breakdown. Then you've got another situation, which is where someone feels a lot of pressure from someone else or the situation that they're in. So the situation applies or puts a lot of pressure on them. And they do the best to hold everything together and hold it together, hold everything together. They have a series of steps of panic attacks maybe towards that point where they have a nervous breakdown. So we've got two forces here. Then a third force, I'm working with a client at the moment who um, moved into menopause and, which is M for menopause, moved into menopause. And as part of this had a complete and utter breakdown that had series of panic attacks. So this is a third area, which is actually things change and it just happened. So 
we will classify them into three different areas. One is that we need to understand that the person's behavior is inducing themselves. So we have to understand a bit more about their psychology. The second is that what, we go, what we're doing is we're understanding the environment that the person's in and how they're interacting with their environment and the pressures that are going on. So I do remember um, I did five years of work at end of life. And I remember a lot of the carers and people that took the roles of carers as part of being a partner of someone who was dying, they would have a lot of breakdowns because there was a huge amount of pressure on them. And then you've got another situation where everything is, you know, there's no pressure inside from the person, no pressure outside, but something just changes and happens. So we call this triaduka, there's three causes of suffering, there's three causes that actually create this kind of issue occurring. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think from my research, and I know we talked a little bit about this in that meeting. Um, I think from my point of view, it's more two causes. I am my mind's in some weird ways slightly simpler. One is you have too much stress, like you're adding too much pressure into the symptoms. And these can be stressful events, it can be internal changes, it can be a combination of both. And the other reason is because the resilience that you have, like kind of the defense mechanism you have against the stress is lower or being breached. And typically, I think what I've seen is usually not one thing that have caused a nervous breakdown, but it's usually, as we always say, the straw that break the camel's back, you know, there's always one thing that trigger. Mm -hmm. And I think that can sometimes be the confusing thing where it almost looks so trivial. Some, some of the things that I've seen, like literally so, so, so trivial. And then it just, uh, something snapped and something, it's just the right amount of pressure that no longer be able to bear or mm -hmm. uh, the, the resilience for some bizarre reason on that day is breached. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's why it's interesting when I research about the topic is a lot of it comes back to stress and what causes stress in our life and everything. Colin, what, what do you think about that? You've mentioned two really, really amazing things here. The first is um, causes. And we, I just touched on tri um And also you've mentioned the word resilience because there's a, a lot of shock for people when they go through this. They experience something that they don't know what they're going through and they don't know how to identify it. Quite often, the person doesn't say, you know, many people say, I'm having a nervous breakdown, but they're not, they're just kind of really stressed. There's sort of a difference between I'm having a nervous breakdown and I'm having a nervous breakdown, because actually we don't recognize that we're having a nervous breakdown when we're having a nervous breakdown. But the shock of it is around the thought that we had the capacity, the thought that we had more resilience, the thought that we had more strength, the thought that we had more ability the thought that we had more capability, the thought that we could manage the things in our lives, the thought we had control, the thought we were in charge, the thought that actually we thought we were calm. Um, we thought we were peaceful. We actually thought we weren't stressed. It, it, it means that for me, there's this kind of like these opposites that are going on is that there is a huge shock in the person when they realize and find out that they thought they were one thing, but something else is actually the case. They're the subject of this huge sort of, you know, like an earthquake does this kind of movement and just moves everything. Um, so when you use the word resilience, it's a, for me, it's a very interesting word because it, it it's, it's almost like a, it's a label, a rule, a promise that we put in that we're able to cope and deal with things. And there is a different reality in place. So, and the next thing is that when we look at causes, I, I like what you said, because causes are a relationship. So twofold, one's a relationship in with ourselves, one's a relationship out to, us, out to the world. And this idea of trauma, and you can split trauma into two different areas. One is trauma with regard to ongoing trauma or trauma with regard to post-traumatic stress disorder, so PTSD. So there's, there's two different levels within trauma there. 
And then this idea of stress and anxiety and stress and anxiety are very interesting as part of this movement inwards and movement outwards into the world and the trauma ongoing or post trauma that that's happening. I'll explain some more about this later as well. And the hormonal changes and mental illness that comes as part of all of this. Does, does that answer your question, Sanford? Yeah, it does. And I think your way of talking about resilience is beautiful because I, so in my, I, because it's such a buzzword and also in, within the medical profession, uh, burnout is quite a severe issues at the moment. So we keep talking, I have training about resilience all the time. And, you know, a lot of the trainings I've received, we keep talking about being able to connect, our general well-being, wellness, healthy thinking, positivity, so on and so forth. But what you said actually really rings true, because I remember a few years ago when I was teaching medical students, he got quite frustrated of all the mention of the buzzword. And he was like, you know what, I know you're a doctor, but I'm a medical student. It is not easy either. You know what it is like, I have student loan, I got all these exams, I got these, all these lectures and tutorials to revise from, I got all these placements to go to and also have family troubles. I'm thinking I'm pretty resilient as a person. So I don't think I need any of you guys keep harping on about it anymore. And I, I remember at that moment, I have similar thoughts and feelings to what you just said is, the person has such a good boundary and almost control of his life at the time. And yes, I truly believe that he has really good resilience at the time. But I think what I was trying to get across is, and I, I did say that to him as well, as like, I really hope that you will be able to keep your current resilience and your support network with you. Because the problem is when you actually graduate and become a doctor, you can literally be allocated anywhere around the country for the next two years in our foundation training. Mm. Uh, the allocation is somewhat random literally uh, and that might mean that you'll be very far away from your friendship group with, from your community from your family from you know your local watering hole that you tend to go to when you have a stressful day and that's the thing all parts of this kind of fixed idea of what my resilience is in some way need to translate and be adaptable and I, I almost felt like some of the training, not all, a, lot of the, a few of the training I've been to is really amazing, but some of the training when they talk about building your level of resilience, and I, I completely agree, like you said, it's almost like a label, it's a bit of a control thing that you have so that you, you can say that, yeah, I'm bearing with the way of life I have now, but not necessarily prepare us for any changes. And, and as we said already, uh, nervous breakdown is all about these changes, all about these additional stress level. And it is, uh, it is just not quite the same, you know. And Lauren saying, yes, it is. I work at Children's Hospital here in Kansas City. I'm glad it's not just in the UK too. Uh, <laughs> Colin, did, did that kind of answer to what you're saying as well? <laughs> I felt like we're going to keep bouncing between yeah. the resilience and stress today is one topic or the other. Well, we've, we've got, so what we're doing is we're, we're, we're identifying, we're laying down a parameter at the moment, which is that actually, first thing is that nervous breakdown is a, a kind of like a, a, a big net that sort of brings in place a number of different, firstly, symptoms. Secondly, it's got variable causes. And as a, as a therapist, one is that we're looking at symptoms and second we're looking at causes. So we're starting to see that actually we need to understand the different stories that people are presenting because it's the stories that they're presenting and how they're interacting with themselves, the relationship they have with themselves, the relationship they have with the world that helps us to then begin to unpick all of the different triggers that are in place for people to help them to help themselves to move out of this condition. Now, there's, there's a number of things. When, when someone's going through this, they don't see it as an opportunity, I can tell you that. So there's no point in sitting down and going, you know what, this is a really great opportunity. They're going to look at you and just kind of go, my life is falling apart. What are you talking about? This is a great opportunity. Um, it, it, but as a therapist, it, it's almost like there is this huge opportunity for someone. 
And I always tell people that there is there's three types of people. Um, have I told you this before, Sanford? Yeah. But please. Tell yeah. I hate boring you. No, no, no. Very interest, interesting as always. I, I, I say there are three types of people. So um, the, the first type of person is they've got the, they're the person with the condition and what happens is that they're just going to get their head down and get through it and just keep going. So they've got a lot of symptoms. So they're the behavior is they're crying, they, they feel guilty, they feel isolated and alone, they're not happy, they've got a bit paranoid, they're a bit manic. You know, they, they kind of fluctuate in many different ways. The behavior is, you know, they go from exhausted, they sleep a lot. They don't understand that they're in this nervous breakdown situation. And they're just gonna keep going no matter who they go to. So. They'll go to numbers of different people. They'll go to someone like yourself, Stanford, who will say, look, you're having a nervous breakdown. You, you know, you need to do this, this, and this. Or they'll surround themselves with people that will complement their view of the world in order to keep them in the situation that they're actually in. And they'll sack those people that actually don't agree with their situation of the world. So this is the first group of people that I come across um, within the situation. It's kind of interesting because as a therapist, you need to be quite clever to identify this sort of person straight away. Um, otherwise, there'll be trouble. The next is um, a group of people that will take on board absolutely everything that you say and or anything that will help them to get out of the situation. So in this, you've got symptoms of what I call, you've got these symptoms at the moment called you know, prana procopia, you've got this agitation of prana symptoms. So I would start to give various different practices. I would give guidance with regard to this. So give an example in yoga with regard to asana and the work of asana, you've got two directions. You've got gati, which means movement. So you get people to do movement. Or you've got shila, which means that you get them to do static stuff. And in this, because a lot of the symptoms of of Vyanavata, the agitation of Vyanavata, I get people to do lying down practices a lot, very, very static, focusing on breathing, working with touching the body in different places, working with very gentle and soft sounds, and getting them to be comfortable with rest, like saying, you know what, a 10 minute nap in the afternoon is completely okay. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I say, 10 minute nap is really okay. And so they start to do a 10 minute nap. They start to do a lying practice. They do breathing. It starts to pacify the eye. They put sesame oil on their abdomen, sesame oil on the joints that are aching. I don't know how it works, but it pacifies things and really helps. And brings the agitation of Vyana Vata down. I'm giving influences with regard to warmth, with regard to moisture, with regard to the food that they're eating. Um, anything that soothes their muscle and breaks. I look at their lifestyle and I'm giving suggestions with regard to travel, loud noises, continual stimulation, drugs, um, exposure to anything that aggravates vata like cold. You know, insufficient sleep or no routine. So I'm starting to look at all these different things with regard to the symptoms and how I can work with the symptoms. Because in order to get to a place where someone can see this as an opportunity, I need them to take some advice and begin to reduce the symptoms. And once we reduce the symptoms, we get a little bit of success. We can start to work deeper. But for me, the first step is the reduction of the symptoms. And the second group of people will start to take this on board. They'll start to kind of begin to question things and go, actually, you're right. Maybe driving here, driving there, driving here, driving there, driving here, driving there, jumping on a plane here, doing that there, and doing this is actually, I just need to settle and just stay in one place. It's just a bit too much for me at the moment. But then all the symptoms come down. And then what happens is that person then kind of goes, hey, everything's okay again. I can get back to my normal life. Thanks. Bye. And then what happens is the cycle then starts to repeat itself again. So 
it means that this is the second group. The third group learn, and they learn from the situation because it, it, it's, it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity you've got, you're in the situation. We may not know how we've got into the situation. We look to blame lots of different people and things. We look to put lots of excuses in place. And as a therapist, you need to outmaneuver the blame and the excuses to come to put in, into practice the different steps that are going to help someone. But they will look at it as an opportunity. And it's this group of people that can then move to looking into how they view the world or the belief systems and the rules that they've created that have got them into trouble. So, so for me, when I'm being presented, I'm sort of looking at these three types of people and just actually sort of saying to people and giving them being honest and going, look, this is what I've come across. And a lot of people kind of go, hmm, I want to be the third category, <laughs> but I don't know if I am. Um, and we all want to be the third category now. Now, I got, I got a slightly mean question to ask. Uh, so, would, do you think in the wrong way a yoga practice can contribute towards a nervous breakdown? Now, I explain my reasoning because I, I have definitely some practice that is very, very deeply releasing and a few of them are with yourself. Um, and in a different context, not with a yoga practice, actually, I, I went to a conference where I was invited as a guest. Um, it's a kind of like a graduation ceremony where the friend of mine who invited me, um, they've gone through a lot of inner work about their own inner world, personality, trauma and things like that. And again, it's really deeply releasing um, experience from what they told us. Unfortunately, halfway through the presentation and the ceremony, someone literally ran up to the stage, re being really grateful and appreciative to the host. However, within the next three to five minutes, suddenly just start kneeling down and full on full body, like praying to the person on stage. And then it was at that point that everyone kind of slightly back and realized, OK, this is kind of like a nervous breakdown in progress. And I, I do wonder, because again, as I said earlier on, you, you sometimes don't really know. I, I, I mean, as skillful as yourself, Colin, you probably can, but sometimes myself, I can't always pick up straight away where the person is at. Can they contribute, like the, what we give, or their own personal practice, can they contribute to, to their breakdown? Traditionally, um... I was very fortunate um, to have studied and learned one-to-one. -one. So what happens was that I've done thousands of hours of one-to-one, -one, which means that I've been fortunate to have a teacher that would sit there with me on an individual basis and, you know, to work and work and work and work. And I've done hours and hours and hours like this so that the teacher knows you completely and tests you completely a lot of the practices are only given to people when there is a, a, a good foundation in place and so the role of a teacher is to test again and again that there is a good foundation in place that the person can then move on and forward and go deeper the difficulty we have nowadays is that, and this is tradition, is that tradition is dead, but long live tradition. Is that we want to, again, we want to do teachings on a, on a very different way. We want to give teachings to absolutely everyone and practices to everyone. And if you look at the symptoms that are being given with regard to the agitation of prana within the system, it means that certain practices and if you think about what practices do is that we've got the capacity to put into a system something that expands the system so we've got the capacity to give something that heats the system up ushna, or expands the system brumana, or we've got the capacity to cool the system down langana or shita so we can cool or contract the system we can create a pressure on the system. So a, a, a kuncha, you can actually create a, 
of pressure in the system in the various different places within the system. So you can either increase pressure or decrease pressure. So when we start to look at these practices is that we can start to create different outcomes by using asana, pranayama, meditation techniques, mantras. And if what's happening is that the system hasn't got the resilience, the back of that word again, needed, which means we haven't tested it again and again, we jump forwards, there starts to become an imbalance within the system. And so it, it, it means that you are completely right, Stanford, is that inappropriate practice will create outcomes. And I've had and seen this a number of times with regard to people that work with different practices on their own or in group environments. And we have to be very careful. I agree, especially through the pandemic as well. And, um, there are more and more kind of online remote learning where sometimes you don't even get to practice with the teacher directly mm -hmm. all that often. I think, I think it's especially tough and easy to kind of you self-selected sometimes uh, into the wrong practice for your state of mind at the time as well. Mm -hmm. As always, I think having good understanding and self-recognition is probably always a good starting point. Um, so I was thinking, because looking in the nervous breakdown, obviously, as I said many times already, you look at stress. And of course, it's very quantify, uh, difficult, sorry, or very difficult to quantify stress. Um, I think most people would agree. Uh, some people did try. There's some psychiatrists back in 1967, I think, Holmes and Rudd, they have a social adjustment scale. And if you're interested, please do have a look. They kind of um, do a really qualitative uh, study, which means they interview people, get them to do this, do a script of what happens. And that these tend to be patients that got admitted into inpatient as well, see what happens in their life, what contributed to the breakdown. Uh, again, it can be psychotic, can be nervous breakdown, can be severe depression or PTSD. Um, and they kind of made a scale that actually quite reproducible. So if we use the scales to see the different sorts of life events that happen to us, it actually quite, quite representative. So the top one, if anyone want to guess, uh, is actually death of a spouse, not divorce. Um, so all these items, they got uh, rank from one to 100, I guess. Um, so 100 is death of a spouse, divorce is only 73. So I think the fact that divorce because the other person is living you will have argument and things like that that the, the grieving process of especially for your marriage or your union or your relationship is definitely there but not so one directional and unfortunate i was i think the death of a spouse is stronger um i i had a little bit of a um calculations because all these scores they added up the item item that happens to us because obviously you don't just have one thing happen to you, you know, most of our life we have like about 17 things happen to us at one time. Um, so you add up the amount of events that happen to you and if the score is more than 300, apparently over the next two years, you have 80% chance of having a nervous breakdown or some sort of breakdown. If it's somewhere between 150 to 299 is uh, 50%, so drop by 30%. I'm, doing that calculation with some patient in mind that I've seen in my previous lifetime in maternity. So pregnancy apparently is 40, sexual difficulty is 39, which sometimes happens. Uh, gaining a new family member, duh, is 39 again. Uh, change in financial state, which obviously often happen during pregnancy and childbirth, 38. Change in a line of work is 36, which again often happen when you take maternity break. Outstanding personal achievement, which some people do think they have, is 28. Change in living conditions, 25. Change in working hours and conditions, 20. Change in residence, 20. And change in sleeping habits, 16. So the total score, uh, if my calculator is correct, is 301, which means, unfortunately, there is a big, big chance of having a breakdown in the next two years. I think I did this because a lot of people that I've seen in stressful period of their life, they 
tend to even pack even more because they try to do more things to regain, regain control of the situation. That's why I see a lot of pregnant women try to move houses and you know, do this and that and try to resolve everything. Uh, but somehow my little math sh shows that actually maybe doing less can actually be helpful because you reduce the amount of stress uh, or stressful events you expose yourself to. Sorry, I kind of deep down in on the math <laughs> equation there, Colin. <laughs> no, this is brilliant because what you've just put forward is change. And if you think about what we do is, is as human beings, is that we create identifications, references, and rules to keep us safe. And those identifications, references, and rules that we put in place to keep us safe, we have those as beliefs that allow us to perceive the world in a particular way. And what change does is it challenges those identifications, those rules, and those beliefs. And it's almost like a storm that comes in and starts to move a boat that's tethered up to a dock and it starts to bang it forwards and backwards until the ropes just suddenly snap. So it, it's interesting that you say that because how we, within meditative practice, we're coming to look at our relationship with things. So do we begin to start to ask questions? We start to ask questions with a meditative practice about, you see, the present is influenced by the past. And so we start to ask questions about how has the past influenced us at this point in time as part of a reflective meditative practice. And what is also alive in the present that and the present situation that has come from the past. So it means that we're starting to begin to question within within changes, the effects of the feelings that we're having, the hooks that are going on, the way that we're being pulled in lots of different directions and not understanding what's happening, we're starting to begin to need to unravel those things. So for me, the questioning that becomes very important as part of this process, but it means there has to be some form of stability first before the questioning comes. Because if there's not stability and there is the questioning, it becomes more of a storm much more of a storm. So you're completely right, Stanford. Actually, the rest rather than moving house, the all of these things become very important before we actually go on the journey to begin to unravel a number of these different things. So for me, there's a kind of like almost a process of this. There's a sort of a, a process around understanding about the past and also based on this asking the question about what we're holding on to because that for me is the next step is to begin to ask that question of people within a reflective practice to say what is it that I'm holding on to and because we hold on to rules we hold on to things that stop our evolution they stop our movement forwards and what we hold on to helps us either to evolve or it stops us from evolving. But we need to be able to question that. And within a nervous breakdown situation, we're trying to hold on to many, many, many things because we've been holding on to so many things before. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um... And just to answer Lizzie as well, so the homes and round social adjust readjustment scale score, that the one that I mentioned is actually for all ages. There's another one for younger than adults or non-adult version as well. So you can easily search for either. And I think 
So I, Colin's going to go much, uh, has gone much deeper than I have, and I think I'm going to stay more physical for this topic. Um, for breakdown, I almost compare it in some way to a burnout, which is something that I think personally I can relate to a little bit more. And it's kind of that chipping away, as you as you said already, it's, it's that little bit of change, a little bit of change that slowly chip away our resilience until it just reached the threshold. And I think from a physical point of view, which obviously always relate to the deeper layer of ourselves, um, when I look at the stages in burnout, uh, usually we start, because um, usually this is occupational burnout, uh, we start really excited, really, really high energy, want to do and achieve a lot, uh, going in like headstrong, trying to do as much as we can, trying to push yourself in through work and take on as much res responsibility as you can. And I think one key pivotal point that I can see in the stages is when we start neglecting our own needs as well. And this is mainly when we talk about like our physical need. Um, so things like sleeping, things like eating, uh, taking care of our bowel habits, um, washing even, um, you know, something as simple as maybe just doing laundry and things like that. And I was reading a book recently and it's, it's interesting. Again, it goes back to the free brain model that I think I talked about before, where a lot of these um, instincts, kind of survival instinct about eating, so your appetite, your sexual drive even, uh, and your sleeping, they're controlled in a very, very uh, basic part of your brain. It's all in the brainstem, in the reptile brain. So these are the ones that is like naturally happen. As soon as you're born, you need to eat, you need to sleep, you need to, you know, defecate and wee yourself. Um, however, as we grow older, our monkey brain and our mammal brain slowly take over. So our emotional, our memory slowly take over. And sometimes we learn to suppress and neglect these needs. And I think in, 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 again, personal experience, I think is when we start neglecting these um, need and almost delude ourselves in thinking oh yeah we'll be fine i can you know i can miss meal for a little bit i can yeah i can just push and just do a little bit more i only need like a few hours sleep last and just now i'll be fine i think these are the damaging steps that slowly build towards that breakdown uh, that's kind of insight and interestingly i'm not sure if i'm reading this right or wrong lizzie uh what you said you know the beliefs about um, survival and adaptation that serves us in our childhood, uh, they can cause more damage later on in life and it's more about being authentic. Um, I almost read it like that, but again, if I'm reading it wrong, I do apologize. <laughs> And she also, do you think the neglect starts in childhood and because it's so incremental, it's so long to manifest? I, I, I... I think one, we, I, I can only speak from personal experience. Uh, we, I haven't learned growing up to tune into my personal needs so much. I think as I grow up, I've always been told you need to have breakfast. Uh, you need to have to, uh, lunch at this time, you need to have dinner at this time, you need to do homework at this time. So my life habit becomes more regimented because that, that's the hours that was given to me either by you know, my family or school. Um, and then just later on, I learned that actually I don't always need to eat breakfast and it does no damage to my body was I actually have to have a quite early lunch and dinner instead. And um, I am more morning person, so I'm happy as above to do homework and stuff first thing in the morning was I really cannot do any work in the evening. I think, I think it's about understanding my rhythm. However, the habits I built over the years as a child, that, that wasn't serving me so much until I really got in tune with myself. So I think, I think that sometimes contributed to the neglect is my habits of listening to other people's regimen for myself instead of listening to myself about what I need right then. I don't know. Colin, am I making sense? Yeah, there's... Um... If we, if you look at um, how we we've got inherited habitual rules or patterns that we have, we've got ones that we learn for ourselves. We've got ones that others impose on us. So we've got combinations of these in place. And if you think about nervous breakdown, you think about this: is that we've, there, we there there are rules that we put in place, like. I have to get this done by this time. 
otherwise this, this, and this is going to happen. And that rule has come from somewhere. And it's a rule of intense pressure. It's one that is a huge amount of pressure that has come from one, ourselves, two, because we've been told or threatened about something, three, that we've learned or seen something in a particular way or someone's imposed something on us in a particular way. So there becomes this sort of dynamic of these things that are laid down that mean that we create a rule that is part and forms part of a belief system. And it, one of the questions that, again, a reflective meditative question to ask is, is what rules have, have I put in place and what rules are actually needed in the situation? Because often we misunderstand the rules that are really needed with the rules that we think there should be. And there's a whole different sort of, it, 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 to start to unpick this and to unpick the, what Lizzie's talking about with regard to these things, it, it's that we're starting to understand how we're operating, how our operation has led us to a situation based on the rules that we haven't seen or we haven't questioned and that did serve us at one time or didn't really serve us. But now it's got us into a situation where, quite frankly, it, 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 we were two seconds away about from pulling a pin out of a grenade or letting the, the grenade thing go off and go, I don't really care. You know, it, it, this, it, so for me as part of, I, I need to get stability first of all. So for me, this, the first point, and this is, becomes important is that many people go into meditative practice in an unstable way and it actually creates more instability. So for me, the first point is to pacify and to create stability and to give someone the tools to maintain some stability in the chaos as they begin to start to shuffle forward to unravel these different things. Because it, it, it's not easy. It's not easy. No, and I know you gave quite a few examples of how you create stability. I think my, <laughs> my natural instinct uh, for, from past experience to create that stability is actually denial. Usually something really bad happened. I pretend that it doesn't, it's not there and that I walk away from the situation for a little bit. Um, just so that I have enough time and mental spaces and energy, then I can go and kind of re-accept <laughs> what has happened to me. Um, maybe denial is not quite a good word because I, I do truly recognize that what is happening, but I think I, I always need to take care of myself first um, before I can take care of the situations. But yeah, I, I think that that will be from a personal experience and otherwise if something really, really bad happens, it's okay to walk away for a little bit <laughs> instead of immerse yourself and keep thinking you can sort it out. <laughs> but, but also this leads, this is part of the next sort of series of meditative questions that I would ask is that it's, it's how would I or how can I um, how can I do something to maintain my sense of self and my sense of stability in myself so actually by walking away, sometimes that actually becomes the important thing because it, we can maintain that sense of self. And often within situations of breakdown is that we lose a sense of self, we lose a sense of identity and who we are. And we've talked about change and we've, to do something different and to look at it as an experiment is one of the ways that I present things forward. I always give an example, um, and make people laugh. I remember the first time I ever cooked dinner for anyone. It was an absolute disaster. I mean, it was a, it was it was so funny. It was so bad. Um, and the person I was with at the time left me. It was so bad. Um, it was really that bad. <laughs> but did it put me off cooking? No. I looked at it as an experiment. And and it it means that every single thing. How do we get someone to look at things as experiments in order to change because it, it's a it's a it's a 
it is a very, very slow process, but it's one of, it, it's one of discovery, it's one of evolution, it's one of expansion, and it really helps someone keep a sense of self. Yeah, and just like you say, um, yeah, break down, this is not just me saying it, but I think, I think in a lot of text that I've searched is also can be a breakthrough as well can be a good thing as well if, if you took the opportunity of change and as Colin always say you know the interaction with the world always give us chance and opportunity to re-examine what who we are and our own identity and I think if and usually in my own personal life if I have enough time to look <laughs> look at them afterwards they, they often represent a good chance for me to break through something that I needed to work at the time. Um, however, to have the necessary strength and time and energy to deal with what happened uh, at each occasion, that is the heart of it. And I'll say, keep eating, keep breathing and keep sleeping. That's kind of my tip for this topic. And, and mine is the opposite of what most people think. Instead of what's the worst that can happen, it's what's the best that I can hope for. And that's the direction that I think is the important direction of dealing with this condition and this situation. Yeah, keep reminding that potential. I agree. So in, in summary, um, we've got a condition which has cause and effect on different domains we've got different symptoms being presented we've got different and varying different causes stanford i really liked the scoring system with regard to causes a number of people i've worked with you know divorce um you know different different you know pregnancy different situations you know a lot of change going on so i really like that scoring system um, so lots of different causes, lots of different symptoms, um, but very similar effects, um, lots of different, very, very similar effects, which people feel and, and similar behaviours that people feel. What to do about it, um, from my perspective, is to pacify, pacify and pacify and pacify. But as part of that, it is to begin to know that things are going to get better but also to not feel that you're inadequate because you can't continue in the way that you were before so there's for me there's a sort of an overlay of things as part of this going through and to know that it's a huge opportunity stanford yep and i think my, my key is one, if you are going through a nervous breakdown, ask for help, try to walk away from the situation. And ultimately, I think literally you have to come back to the basic need of looking after yourself and your body. So literally keep breathing, keep eating, keep sleeping. I think that's in my experience, quite a good thing. <laughs> yeah, and support and communication. Absolutely. Find Colin. Talk to Colin. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stanford. And I think we are meeting again. What are we looking at next time? We are looking into obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Hmm. But that would be very exciting. And maybe plus a few myths or talk about a few misconceptions, how it can affect our life, maybe how it can help our life in some way too. But also, I think next Monday we have an exciting conference coming up as well. Colin, do you, what is it called again? Global Global Yoga Therapy Conference. Um, so we're we're really um, excited actually to be have been invited. So Stanford and I have been invited to um, present at the the up and coming Global Yoga Therapy Day um, conference, um, and we're going to be presenting on Stanford's favorite topic, which is anger. Anger, I'm so honoured to, one, present with you again, two, present in the conference, and three, had the chance to revisit Anger, because it's our first one. I think we did okay, but having the chance to go for it again would be amazing, so I'm looking forward to it.
So if you want to catch it, I think we're going live next Monday morning, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. But I think that catch it that if you don't want to wake up that early and talk, talking about anger or listening to two men talking about anger, being angry. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stanford. Um, <laughs> thank you to everyone for coming as well. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, this what we've discussed is a framework. Uh, hopefully it's, it's a framework that um, is useful because it, it, there's a lot of stuff covered here that we could go deeper on to, into each sort of topic in each area that we've sort of discussed. So thank you, thank you for, for coming. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Good night.